So welcome to this afternoon's panel that will examine the growing regional threats in the West Pacific, uh, Japan's response, and shed some light, I hope, on the prospects for strengthening the alliance of the Pacific's democratic states. I'm Seth Cropsey, senior fellow here at Hudson, and also director of Hudson's Center for American Sea Power. Uh, allow me to begin with a story. A man who believed that the future could be known went to a future teller, a soothsayer, and asked her to look into the future and say, what did she see? So the soothsayer consulted her crystal ball and told the man that he would die because of water. The man believed the soothsayer. He assumed that avoiding ship voyages, uh, living near a body of water, and violent rainstorms would provide safety. So he moved to the desert, and there he died from lack of water. Sometimes, by doing the things we most seek to avoid, we find ourselves in bigger trouble. Japan's constitutional restrictions on its defensive abilities were put in place following a war that ended nearly three quarters of a century ago. Since then, Japan has become a fully functioning democratic state with almost all the characteristics of the world's other great democracies. A robust multi-party political system, a free press, an independent judiciary, constitutionally protected freedom of religion and of speech. However, you'll note that I said almost all the characteristics of the world's other great democracies. That's because of Article 9 of Japan's constitution. As many of you know, Article 9 forever renounces war as a sovereign right of the nation. It renounces the threat of use of force as a means of settling international disputes. Perhaps not as well known outside Japan, the aim of these unique restrictions on the state's ability to defend its citizens is Article 9's justification for the restrictions. This justification is the sincere aspiration to international peace based on justice and order. That's a quote. We have neither the time nor is it our purpose here to examine whether a hope for peace provides any state with security. But we can ask whether Japan's noble aspiration has had any effect whatsoever on, for example, China and North Korea. The answer to that is a resounding no. The sincerity of Japan's hope for international peace based on justice and order is beyond question. At the same time, the determination of Xi Jinping and Kim Jong-un to use force, threats, and an ever-growing arsenal of conventional and strategic weapons as instruments of their state's power is also beyond question. Prime Minister Abe is seeking to modify Article 9. The growing threats to regional security, which will be discussed in detail this afternoon, make the Prime Minister's concern clear. North Korea's repeated missile and nuclear weapons tests solidify its claim to be an international actor of consequence and a major regional power. Ongoing missile and nuclear device threats tests demonstrate not only Pyongyang's growing ability, they have 
shown so far that Japan, South Korea, and the United States' condemnation of these provocations is exactly that, condemnation. Yes, there are sanctions, but North Korea still receives oil imports. And as some of you may have noticed in recent news, I think today, they are still exporting arms illegally, like at their attempt to export grenade launchers to Egypt, which Egypt stopped. And then there is Vladimir Putin's observation at the beginning of last month that Kim Jong-un would rather have his people eat grass before he ends his missile and nuclear programs. Is Putin wrong? What we're left with is that there remains no agreed-on plan to moderate Pyongyang. Where does this lead? A return of U.S. tactical nuclear weapons to South Korean soil? A South Korean nuclear weapons development program? Would Japan willingly become the only regional power without nuclear weapons? Like a boulder thrown into a still pond, the waves uh, end the calm. Leaving aside for a question the, uh, the, of, just for a moment, uh, the question of North Korea's growing offensive power, are we witnessing the emergence of a strategic arms race in the West Pacific? East Asia's conventional balance is equally problematic today, not in the future. This is an important subject of today's event. Again, I'd like to offer a personal short anecdote. As director of another Washington think tank, Asia Studies Center, I was invited to visit China in the 1990s. It was my first visit. My Chinese hosts proposed a schedule and asked me if there was anything in particular that I wanted to see. Relations between Washington and Beijing were a lot better than they are today. I called a former commandant of the U.S. Marine Corps and asked him if it would be worth it to look into China's amphibious capability. He, uh, he was amused at my question and said that Chinese amphibious capabilities were inconsiderable. He said that my time would be better spent looking into the PLA Navy's surface and submarine capabilities and China's effort to project power in the region. This has changed today. Under Xi Jinping, the PLA has been reorganized and consolidated to increase its joint operations abilities and carry out a modernization program that will substantially improve China's electronic warfare, cyber, and information warfare capability. An increasingly aggressive China is also developing the kinetic side of its military. The Chinese high command needs no encouragement to understand the strategic value of the islands it has created and armed in the South China Sea. Similar, similarly, there is a clear focus on adding to the threat it presents to Taiwan, to Japan's Senkaku Islands, and other disputed islands in the region, extending as far south as the Philippines. Seizing islands is extremely difficult without amphibious capability. China has been developing such capability for the last 25 years. The PLA Navy will have its first large deck amphibious assault ship, the Type 075, in about two years. When it comes out of a Shanghai shipyard in 2020, the Type 75 will displace approximately the same tonnage as the U.S. amphibious assault ship WASP, about 40,000 tons. We'll carry about 30 helicopters and a well deck from which amphibious assault vehicles can send men and equipment from ship to shore. The Western Pacific is dotted with island chains to the east of the Asian mainland. Of these chains, none is more important than the United States' treaty ally, Japan. 
a nation that reaches from the small islands south of Okinawa to Hokkaido, a distance of over 1,600 miles. From the East China Sea to the Sea of Japan, a stretch of sovereign land that lies across from China, the Korean Peninsula, and Russia. Japan's recognition of the region's amphibious character, character may not have been swift, but it is moving in the right direction. And that is to build appropriate combat capabilities. As of the spring this year, Japan now possesses two nearly 20,000 ton helicopter carriers. Japan will also purchase amphibious assault vehicles as well as other defense equipment needed to project power from sea to shore. All indications are that those entrusted with Japan's defense are gradually developing the force structure needed to build an effective amphibious force. This suits Japan's geography, and in particular, the military questions that continue to be raised by China's provocations in and around the Senkaku Islands. Those of us who wish Japan well believe that increasingly robust Japanese defenses strengthen both the existing defense cooperation between the U.S. and Japan and the alliance that helps assure both nations' security. With us today are Rick Fisher, an expert on China's military, Paul Jara, a former naval officer with particular expertise on U.S.-Japan security issues, Jun Isamura, a Hudson Senior Fellow who is exceptionally knowledgeable about Japan's defense and foreign policy communities, and Kanji Ishimoto, who brings to our discussion this afternoon long expertise on the industrial side of Japan's defense capabilities. I think their full bios are in the handout that I hope you've received. Uh, I'd also like to recognize and welcome Admiral Kenichi Kuramoto, who's former Commander-in-Chief of Japan's Self-Defense Force, uh, and also Mr. Yasuo, Yasuo Kawanishi, uh, of Shinmewa Industries. We're delighted that you could join us this morning. Following our panelists' presentations, there will be a question period. When called on for a question, would you please tell us your name and your organization and to which panelist you are asking the question? We would appreciate that. Thank you very much. Rick, it's all yours. Thank you, sir. Okay. Working. Okay. Working. Is it on? Yes. All right. Fantastic. Many moons ago, I was a beneficiary of uh, Seth Cropsey's leadership at that other think tank that he mentioned, and it's always an honor to be invited back to uh, uh, Seth's deck, uh, no matter how small. And uh, it is also a wonderful pleasure to join this distinguished panel, my longtime friend Paul Giera, and our, our esteemed guests and uh, friends uh, from, from Japan. And on this wonderful, blustery day, uh, a, a triple thanks to all of those in the audience who've uh, decided to uh, grace us uh, and, and uh, contribute to our dialogue today on these, on these pressing subjects. What I'd like to do is uh, briefly examine four threat vectors that uh, China aims at Japan. Of course, these threats are not just aimed at Japan, but also threaten the security and interests of South Korea, Taiwan, and of course, the direct and broad security interests of the United States and our other allies, the Philippines, 
Australia, not to mention our various friends with whom we cooperate uh, uh, very usefully. These threat vectors are China's assistance to North Korea, uh, its growing threat to the Ryukyu Island chain, third, its looming threat of invasion against Taiwan, and fourth, how control of Taiwan would allow China to consolidate its control of the South China Sea and ensure global power projection access that would in turn threaten Japan's, allow China to threaten Japan's global interests and uh, so many, that of so many other countries. I'll conclude with some very brief recommendations, but basically we have to get very, very serious about the arms race that China is forcing upon us. And the democracies need to strive for a much higher level of direct cooperation, even if on an informal basis, that equips all of us to better determine when China is going to be making its military moves. Now, regarding China's enabling of the North Korean missile threat, I prefer just to call them North Korean Chinese missiles. China is so involved in the North Korean program. My, my estimation is that in 2003, the Chinese made two decisions. The Americans invaded Iraq. That shocked them. So amongst other equities, they decided to do two things for the North Koreans. First, to start the six-party talks, which were designed to do nothing but obfuscate, delay, and divert. They weren't designed to accomplish anything regarding a reduction in North Korea's nuclear threat. And then secondly, China began to upgrade North Korea's military capabilities. North Korea's current ICBM is launched from a Chinese truck, 16-wheel truck. It's currently a liquid-fueled ICBM. But in the very near future, North Korea will have solid-fueled ICBMs and solid-fueled medium-range ballistic missiles. What will carry them? Well, the big 16-wheel truck was slightly controversial, and uh, there may have been additional exports of this truck since 2011 or not. But what the, Ch what the Chinese are doing for the North Koreans is they have sold them the ability to make a new generation of transporter erector or launchers for their new solid fuel missiles. In the middle here, we see the North Korean model, at least, of its new medium range solid fuel ballistic missile. And right next to it is a truck cab from the Chinese Sino Truck Corporation. <clears throat> 2013, Sino Truck began a joint venture in North Korea and is now producing transport for missiles and, and other systems for the North Koreans. And in the not too distant future, we may also witness another transfer of Chinese technology, multiple warhead capabilities for the North Korean missiles. In January, Pakistan tested a three warhead uh, me medium range ballistic missile. It's a bit of a debate between me and my uh, Indian friends as to whether the technology came from China, Pakistan is now going to go to North Korea, or whether the Chinese gave that technology to uh, uh, North Korea directly, and the Pakistanis were subcontracted to test it last January. At any rate, the next uh, North Korean ICBM might have three warheads. And China does this to tie down the Allies, divert us, and, and essentially allow China the time to pursue its security interests, which further threaten those of the United States and its 
and its allies, especially Japan. Now, there is an arms race going on between China, Japan, other countries, but the race is pretty, pretty steep between China and Japan, and the Japanese are not giving a lot of quarter. They're a bit behind, but they could catch up. And uh, they have a lot of reason to, because it's clear that China is increasingly threatening Japan's hold, not just on the Senkaku Dayutai, but on the Ryukyu chain as well. Uh, the Chinese campaign of harassment by Coast Guard and fishing ships and its constant uh, uh, launch of uh, air exercises is, is one thing. But the buildup of forces is also impressive. The invasion capability, formal invasion capabilities that Seth mentioned, the new uh, LHD will join uh, six, soon six large LPDs, about 20, 25,000 tons. Missiles. China has just deployed its DF-16 thousand range, thousand kilometer range ballistic missile to Jinhua so that it can both target Okinawa and Taipei. And here we see some examples of the arms race, or really a direct race of arms. A, the Chinese are now building the Russian-Ukrainian Zuber, large hovercraft, about a 500 ton capability, but only 40 knot speed. Japan is going to be buying the MV-22 Osprey, only about a 10 ton uh, cargo capacity, but a uh, over 250 knot speed. Both China and Japan are developing trimaran fast combat ships, very well suited for combat uh, it, close to islands. China is now developing a heavy lift helicopter, 10 tons internally, 15 tons on a sling, with sufficient range to reach the Senkakus or the Sakashimas. And China covets the Sakashimas because that will help to surround Taiwan, intimidate Taiwan, or if necessary, contribute to the invasion of Taiwan. China is also quickly investing in dominant air superiority. Within the last uh, week, the Chinese have announced that their new fifth generation fighter, the Chengdu J-20, has been commissioned. This means uh, that it has a, a formal place within current testing and development units. But the big news is that China has successfully put an indigenous turbofan on the J-20. Since 2011 or so, they've been flying on uh, Russian engines. The indigenous engine will allow to come to pass a curious report that was in the Hong Kong uh, Ming Bao in late December. Ming Bao reported that China would first build about 100 of its fifth generation J-20 equipped with either a Russian or the Ch indigenous Chinese turbofan. But after the development of a more powerful Chinese turbofan, 15 to 18 tons thrust, then China will build 400 of its J-20s for a total of 500 of these fifth generation fighters, which are quite comparable to the F-22 uh, and the F-35, largely because they benefited from espionage against those aircraft. China is also committing to full-scale production of a four-plus generation fighter, the J-16, which is roughly a copy of uh, the Russian Sukhoi Su-30, a very capable, large, long-range, uh, uh, large payload strike fighter. And we can, as, as is happening now in the United States, we can expect that the Chinese will develop cooperative fifth generation plus four plus generation uh, combat operations. The third threat vector is what is very likely 
a near term a, a growing threat of near term invasion of taiwan china of course has never abandoned its goal of seizing taiwan and this goal has become more urgent in recent decades because of taiwan's transition to democracy a a a, a poll in the in the chinese universe that rejects and every day provides an example to all other chinese living under the chinese communist party dictatorship as seth has mentioned china has been building up its formal amphibious assault capabilities but just as important china for a long time has been mobilizing its civilian maritime lift its maritime militia and this would include thousands of roll on roll off barges of the type we saw china used to build the uh, island bases in the south china sea plus many newly built very large ferries just using the large ferries that are based in the bohai sea china could put about 150,000 troops into north korea and according according to a book that everybody should read when it comes out very soon by Ian Easton of the 2049 Institute a very impressive book on China's preparations for the invasion of Taiwan Ian posits that Chi that Chinese planners estimate they may have to put a million soldiers on Taiwan and uh if they capture ports if they have great weather they have great luck they may be able to do it what would be the impact of the conquest of Taiwan on Japan it would be a remarkable disaster for Japan not just for Japan but for american interests and for the cause of freedom in general but ian easton uncovered a, a very significant morsel for our japanese friends and uh, he's allowed me today to quote it and i just want to read it to you it's from a japanese or chinese publication on the japanese air self defense force uh published in 2013 and it says quote as soon as taiwan is reunified with mainland china japan's maritime lines of communication will fall completely within the striking ranges of china's fighters and bombers our analysis shows that by using blockades we can reduce japan's raw imports by 15 to 20% it will be a heavy blow to japan's economy after imports have been reduced by 30% japan's economic activity and war making potential will be basically destroyed after imports have been reduced by 50% even if they use rationing to limit consumption japan's national economy and war making potential will collapse entirely blockades can cause sea shipments to decrease and can even create famine within the japanese islands that's what they that's what one corner of the people's liberation army hopes that they're able to do to japan once they conquer taiwan and the people's liberation army navy blockade capability may be growing uh a recently retired uh chinese uh, rear admiral gave a lecture at a chinese his at a chinese university his slides were put on the internet and amongst the modernization programs that he highlighted for the students at the university is that china is considering a new nuclear propelled air independent propulsion system so that they can make an inexpensive nuclear powered submarine they also want to put their new anti ship ballistic missiles on ships at sea and by my estimation probably on submarines as well and the admiral also stated that they're committed to building a fifth generation carrier air wing for their future aircraft carriers a fourth threat vector would be controlling the south china sea and then following through with plans for global power projection control of taiwan 
means that China will have direct access to the deepest waters of the Pacific and will divide the democratic allies from north to south. Chinese nuclear ballistic missile submarines will have access to those deep patrol zones and be safer because of it. And controlling Taiwan also strengthens Chinese control over the South China Sea, which China views as essential for power projection into the Indian Ocean and also power projection into space because deep space missions are going to be launched from Hainan Island in the South China Sea. Okay, to conclude, I'm not taking up too much time, I have some, just some brief recommendations. I think it's time for the administration to seize the rhetorical high ground and call North Korea's missiles what they truly are. They are North Korean Chinese missiles. We should do this as part of our pressure on Beijing to force them to withdraw all of the assistance that they've been giving to the North Koreans. But given the imminence of North Korea's nuclear missile threat and the impact this capability will have on, larger, on the larger nuclear balance and our ability, the American ability, to ensure an extended nuclear deterrent, I believe it is time to consider the redeployment of tactical nuclear weapons on US Navy ships and to begin talking to our allies about NATO-style joint basing of tactical nuclear weapons. So this strikes me as the most inexpensive and impressive way to get the attention of Pyongyang and <laughs> Beijing. We should also be paying far more attention to the arms race that the PLA is trying to lead. There is a real, this is the time right now for joint Japanese-American development of energy weapons. We both have programs. Let's make them succeed faster. It's time to develop space combat systems because the PLA is doing just that because it's time to, right now, invest in the systems that will keep us current as China deploys its sixth generation of combat capabilities centered around the weaponization of information, energy weapons, and space dominance. Fourth, we need real leadership in deterring the war on the Taiwan Strait. This means the United States has to be true to the Taiwan Relations Act and help Taiwan with the weapons and technology that it needs to deter a Chinese invasion. This means F-35 Bravo sales in the very near term. And it also could mean sale of technology to allow Taiwan to develop thousands, build thousands of cheap, long-range anti-ship cruise missiles. And we should also strive to in integrate Taiwan to a much higher degree in our mutual defense planning. And then finally, we should be inviting India to join an informal surveillance and data sharing network that combines the surveillance inputs, their surveillance input inputs with potentially those of the United States, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Paul, it's all yours. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, but I have a very hard act to follow um, because Rick Fisher and I uh, go way back, and the reason we do is because um, we agree on everything. So uh, there will be some overlap between what Rick and I said, but just for the record, we haven't rehearsed it. Uh, so our, our, our views are quite similar. Uh, I want to thank Seth uh, for asking me to come this afternoon. I always do what Seth 
Cropsey asks me to do, and I recommend that course of action to the rest of you. Um, and what he asked me to do was to speak about what Japan can do under these uh, increasingly difficult strategic circumstances. And so I'll try to cover that strategy um, and those, some of those particulars. Um, and, and I want to do so from a single perspective, which I think um, captures American strategy in the Asia Pacific and in some ways um, more generally and globally. And that is that the American Pacific security strategy is to defend the first island chain from the first island chain with the inhabitants of the first island chain. Um, I don't think you'll see that in too many American strategic documents, but I think basically that synthesizes what we're trying to do. Um, it certainly synthesizes what I think we should be doing. So from that perspective, I want to talk about two points. Um, the first is suspending disbelief. Uh, and the second is getting to know, N-O, the negative, getting to what doesn't work. So um, I'm not quite sure, as I was preparing my remarks, I wasn't quite sure which I should talk about first. But I think the suspending disbelief aspect of what I see is probably so fundamental to everything else that I want to, I want to address that first. Um, it's been a long time since World War II. And for almost that entire period, Japan was quite comfortable, and frankly, so was everyone else, in um, avoiding the issue of whether or not it was going to have to defend itself. I mean, really have to defend itself. They were quite obviously the growth of the self-defense forces and the strength of the U.S.-Japan alliance and so on uh, are factors of the past. Uh, I'm very familiar with those. I was the alliance manager for five years at OSD. Um, however, um, the reality was that until fairly recently, Japan was able to avoid the implications and the consequences of really being a frontline state. That's no longer the case, and I think Japan is coming to grips with that, at least in some technical ways. Um, it, clearly, the Ministry of Defense understands that. But I think more broadly, the Japanese body politic doesn't. The reason I say that is because of a debate I had with a colleague when we were, walk when we were working together on a project to lay out some of the challenges for Japan and the United States in the Asia Pacific. And we had a knockdown, drag out debate over a, a, what I think is probably a key analytical point, which is whether or not we could consider that Japan was going to change or was changing, in fact, without there being a change in Japan's defense budget not the details of the defense budget, but basically the level of defense expenditures, whether or not those expenditures would be keyed to and remain at approximately 1% of Japan's GDP. I'm not sure I was right, but what I said was, well, lots of things are happening inside the loop of Japan Japanese defense planning, and therefore um, the change in overall defense expenditures is not necessary to conclude that things are changing in Japan. I think that's right, but the question I think probably is whether or not they're changing enough. It's quite obvious that the diet is in no mood to increase defense expenditures. And without that, just as here with our Congress, without that, um, this whole idea of disbelief of what's coming is really quite real. Um, it's, it's quite clear in my mind that Japan has not come to grips with this. Now, if, in case you think I'm picking on Japan here, I'm not because I think the same problem 
exists in this country. So this, there's plenty of this to go around. Um, so if that's the case, um, what are some of the things that Japan can do in the meantime before the country comes around to a common view of frontline state status, the China threat, and what it really means for Japan? Um, I'm reminded, uh, I think usefully, of the interwar period here in the United States when the policy, the national policy, was isolationism. Okay? And we were going to avoid war in Europe. And we probably didn't see the war in Asia coming, but the point being that we were going to avoid that war. We were simply going to step back and not engage. This really challenged the American military because there was very, very little money and very little political support for preparation. Now, that changed once the war in Europe started, but up until that time, the American military was really very hard-pressed. But the American military understood at that time that while some things were against national policy, and in fact, some things were against the law, unrestricted submarine warfare, for instance, which had been outlawed by the uh, Versailles Treaty after World War I, that we could think about it. And this was the period when uh, General Marshall described as we had all the time to think and no money. And then shortly thereafter, it became we had all the money in the world, but no time to think. So we used that time uh, very profitably. And uh, we, we were still behind. It wasn't until the end of 1943 that the equipment that we envisioned needing started to come online uh, and then operations changed in the Pacific for instance and of course then the invasion of uh, Europe in 1944. So thinking ahead even if those the things you're considering are against policy against law and against the, the thrust of thinking in the nation is something that can be done, and it needs to be done much more than it is now. Um, and in that context, I want to say one more thing, and that is that thinking about this, I think, can be conducted in the context of a deterrence strategy. So if, in fact, the, the Diet and the Congress and the peoples of our countries, the media, don't want to go to war with China, despite what everything that Rick Fisher just said about the China threat, then we're going to have to prepare for it. There's an irony here. There's a, there's a seeming contradiction, but it is, in fact, the essence of a deterrence strategy. So this is the first thing I want to flag, that thinking about deterrence in the context of suspending disbelief is probably the single most important and most fundamental thing we can come to grips with. More specifically, in the second aspect of what I'm talking about, I want to talk about getting to know. N-O, not K-N-O-W. Most of the time, we think in terms of getting to yes, getting to some positive conclusion, getting to, OK, what's going to work, or what do we have to do? But again, going back to the interwar period, I want to use the example of the U.S. Navy. The U.S. Navy had been thinking about Japan as an opponent, not exclusively, for a long time by the time the attack on Pearl Harbor occurred, since just after the turn of the century, since, certainly since the Battle of Tsushima in the Russo-Japanese War, when Japan presented itself as a major naval power. Um, and the, the thinking was in the context of Alfred Thayer Mahan's sea power theories. And the idea that Mahan presented was that two great navies would come together, the good navy would win, uh, and um, 
then that nation would be able to use the sea for its other strategic purposes. In the period, however, between the time Mahan wrote and the time that uh, the 1920s and 30s, air power had developed, and this gave geography a new meaning in the context of naval strategies. And it gave the lie to the idea. It contradicted and prevented the idea of this express naval thrust into the far Pacific, American naval thrust, to defend the Philippines. Because that wasn't going to work. Because the, the Japanese Navy was going to, through the use of island bases, going to be able to interdict and, and um, decimate that naval foray. And so the U.S. Navy did the most difficult thing imaginable for a military, and that is to understand what wouldn't work, that, that its doctrines, its strategy, its capabilities would not work. And the U.S. Navy reorganized around the idea of an incremental bring everything with you as you go logistics strategy across the Pacific. That's why the Philippines had to be abandoned in early 1942, because we weren't able to do that. So I recommend the same kind of approach for Japan, because in my view, and I've been thinking about this for a long, long time, what we do now, individually and together, will not work. There are many different reasons for that. One, we're not sufficiently taking into account the kinds of new capabilities, force structures, and force levels that Rick uh, Fisher has talked about. Um, two, we are not building up uh, the way we should. But three, in particular, the Japanese militaries and American militaries services, and I, you, you might be surprised when I say this, are not integrated. There does not exist the technical or command structures to fight against a peer competitor in the Asia Pacific. There does not. Without working through the fact that that doesn't work and coming to grips with the fact that we're going to have to change around that conclusion, we're not going to be able to get to the first principle, which is the deterrence uh, posture strategy and capabilities necessary to prevent war with China. Because in the meantime, the Chinese will understand that these structures are not integrated and that the alliance will not work. So what are some of the things um, that we can think about in terms of uh, working together once we've concluded that what we do now will work? We're going to have to consider together as an alliance the new tempo of military operations. This is not something we talk about. We're going to have to think about new postures and new areas of combat. This is not something we talk about. The areas of combat we consider now are very, very close to Japan as an alliance. The, the external operations are left to the United States as someone else's business, not alliance business. This, this can't continue if we're going to be serious. Another thing, uh, the, the full range of C4 ISR systems and capabilities and organizations, command control, computers, communications, uh, in intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Um, if we are operating from different systems, we are going to be split on the battlefield just the way Napoleon split his opponents. The only time he ever failed to do that was at the Battle of Waterloo. So um, th there's a long list. I could go on. But without that kind of integration, for, thought about in advance, planned for carefully against the grain of the way we've always done things, 
then uh, we're going to be in serious trouble. The Chinese will know it, and um, then we will have to accept Chinese conclusions and preferences. Uh, finally, there's one thing that, um, that we haven't been thinking about that's really important. I agree completely with um, Rick Fisher. There are two things, excuse me. Um, the first is Taiwan. This is not somebody else's business. Taiwan is essentially Japan's flank on the first island chain. If Taiwan is lost, the security and the ability to defend the first island chain is severely compromised. So thinking about that from the perspective of the defense of Japan is something I think we're going to have to take on. The second thing that I want to mention, and I could go on, but I want to not take too much time, is that of nuclear weapons. I believe this is an American responsibility um, and that we are way, way behind in thinking about the new posture for nuclear weapons on a global scale. Um, since the end of the Cold War, um, the, uh, the reduced to zero lobby has influenced uh, thinking and common views of nuclear weapons. And uh, it would seem to me that that's not right, and that the alternative uh, for that is first, as Rick said, to reintroduce tactical nuclear weapons throughout the American military, both ashore and at sea. First at sea, in the US Navy, which uh, took out its tactical nuclear weapons in the early 1990s. The obvious key issue with regard to nuclear weapons in Japan is whether or not the time has come for Japan to accept the idea, and Ishiba-san uh, has talked about this in the press and here in Washington, whether or not the United States should introduce tactical nuclear weapons into Japan under either American custody or dual custody with Japan. Um, it's time to talk about that. It's time to talk about it seriously because so many of these other things that we're doing don't work and it has direct connotation for and implications for the kind of deterrence strategy that I talked about at the beginning of my remarks. Thank you very much. start. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Kanji Shimaru from Japan. Uh, this, I'm very glad to be here. and This is our first opportunity to have uh, such a presentation in the Hudson Institute. Uh, my background is engineering and uh, as a matter of fact uh, I used to be a, a chief engineer of a US2 product. Uh, we will show me later. Uh, be later. And the, uh, this is not a sales talk. <laughs> this is just uh, as a manufacturer of an aircraft, uh, we'd like to uh, present our thought and view how we do the act of the tension in the East and South China Sea. Please look at the uh, PowerPoint in the front. US and Japan alliance faces a new stage of uh, threats from China and the North. Obviously, the Korea runs a missile, and uh, right today is uh, breaking news in the Japan. In the past uh, three months, uh, TV shows all uh, early in the morning. It says the Korean missile launch. You have to evacuate right now under the ground. This is really an uh, unusual situation, and we really feel sad in such a cases. So this is a threat. And also the China uh, also sees the first and the second iron chains as a lifeline strategically, 
and their steadfast military strategy, so-called anti-access area denial, AD. We'll see the detail in the picture later. And recently, as you know, China developed, actually copied new amphibious capability. It is an aggressive weapon man that will support expanding presence of the PLO Navy and Air Force activities as the West Pacific. So it's time to Japan must increase our amphibious capability. It, the, according to the internet, says that the PLA will introduce 17 units of new amphibian code name AG600. Those will deploy in the East and South China Sea. So let's look at the detail of the, what it looks like of the AG600. Although there are no amphibious seaplanes in the U.S. weapon system, actually they are replaced with the aircraft carrier and helicopter all over the world. China is going to introduce new amphibian to the Navy. Chinese state-owned AVIC, which is a company name, is developing new amphibian AG-600, and its performance is quite similar as Japanese amphibian US-2, which is our product, except running limit of a wave height. So the mission of AG-600 will be not only for search and rescue, but also deploying special forces, ISR, even combat search and rescue in the East and the South Sea area. So these figures show the outlook of the, uh, what it looks like uh, of the aircraft itself in the picture. No maiden flight conducted yet. And the red one show the AG-600 and blue one is a Japanese US-2. Mm -hmm. So it's quite resemble and the, on the size comparison and the performance comparison in the radar chart, except for the landing capability. So this is a very uh, special map. Uh, this is map is upside down. Uh, the upper is the south, and north, uh, bottom is the north. This gives you an idea what it looks like and what they think about expand their border using uh, what, co what is called the first and the second island chain. There's a three line. One is the, one is the, this one. This line shows the first island chain, including Japan island itself. And there's a Senkaku around here. And the, this is Taiwan. And they are thinking to expand the second island changes, chain, including Guam. And finally, the dot line shows the third island changes, including your Hawaii Islands. So this is a really threat for our Japanese, not only for the Japanese, but also the Asian people. So Chinese expansionism rise tension at the east, South China Sea. So one is a suggestion from us in broader process of the U.S.-Japan defense cooperation. Japan should increase their capability. There will be some example what Japan can do for increasing our cooperation. We'll see the detail in the U.S. two cases in the next slide, especially increase Japanese capability to defend against growing Chinese amphibious capability in four areas. One for the surface is the sea surface, second is south surface under the sea, the third is the air, and the fourth is the budget. As you may know that the US-2 is, uh, is a marginal mission aircraft. So that could be contributed in the various way, not only for the search and rescue, but also ISR and transport special forces. And that could be support for the fleet and submarine, logistic support, and anti-piracy 
and law enforcement. And uh, this is a real actual uh, activities for the disaster relief in the past of the big earthquake in the Japanese earthquake and the humanitarian assistance, such as the uh, tsunami in the Philippines or fire fighting against the Indonesia. This is our plan. So let, let's look at the widely international contribution. Oh, this is a picture of from the Middle East to the Japan. The red line shows the what is called one belt, one road is Chinese strategy to expand on the land basis and the uh, water basis, both right. And the, you could see the yellow line from the Middle East to Japan. This is a very, very important lifeline for the Japanese. You may well know that uh, Japan has a very, very uh, little uh, natural resources, which is gas, uh, oil. According to the internet, it's 99.6% uh, are imported from Middle East. That's produced, that's energy produced, all the electricity, automobile, such and such. So once the lifeline is cut, it, Japan will die. So the yellow line must protect for the Japanese Japan. You may know that the Gypsy in the front uh, from the Middle East, the James SDF, the first outer sea bases to protect the life line and also anti uh, piracy. And as you know that the we uh, continuing discussion is a G2B, G2G basis with India with uh, most, more than five years to transfer our US2. And we have a discussion with uh, Indonesia and the Philippines also. Let's look at a very uh, short video how it looks like of the US2. The US-2 is the only aircraft in the world that can provide global safety and security almost year-round. The US-2, manufactured by Japan's Shinmeiwa Industries. The Maritime Self-Defense Force currently uses the US-2 in sea rescue operations and to transport emergency patients from outlying islands. It is also used to help transport people and cargo. This is the scene of an actual rescue. The US-2 flew from its standby base and made a landing on water at this spot. The landing distance was 330 meters. A lifeboat took the emergency patients to the aircraft. Once they were on board, the aircraft took off. The takeoff distance was around 280 meters. The patients were flown to the US-2's base and then taken to a medical facility. Brighten Your Future, brought to you by Shin Meiwa. So finally, I would like to uh, present some of the closing uh, uh, ideas uh, with a change of uh, constitution interpretation to allow the restrict exercise of the right collective self-defense right, enlarging of a Japanese contribution for keeping peace of Asia. Nowadays, uh, Japan is uh, changing uh, slowly, slowly, slowly. And the, also, the three weapon political policy are getting relief. So now we could export the, some of the uh, weapons under the agreement of the NSG. Also, what is called ATRA, ATLA, is the agency. It's treating the, the export 
and joint development is be settled already. Also, Chinese expansionism in the East and South China Sea bring unstable situation to the region. So the most important issue will be increasing Japanese capability. As I mentioned, several countries such as India, Indonesia, and Greece are also interested in acquiring the improved amphibious capability that will add to Japanese security. So collaboration with US defense equipment industry will enable Japan to expand its role in our defense cooperation, including ISR, military exercise, and joint training, etc. So that's all for all my presentation. Thank you for your attention and arigato. I, I am uh, Juni Somura, a senior fellow at Hudson Institute. And uh, as a last speaker, I thought my role was uh, to keep time, uh, but the other speakers, uh, well, uh, keep, uh, keeping time, so we have plenty of time for Q&A. And so just I briefly uh, talk about North Korea and uh, U.S.-Japan Defense Cooperation. And uh, uh, I will uh, talk about different point of view uh, the, about North Korea. In the history of several thousand years in China, the Korea and Vietnam were always troublesome countries for China. Uh, even Korea was a colony of China with a, a tributary system, but it was very hard to control Korea. And even the Yen Dynasty in 13th century by Mongolian, uh, they didn't involve much into Korea. And on the other hand, Japan and Japan's annexation of uh, Korea in 1910, uh, that was a Japanese historical terrible uh, mistake, I think. And uh, it, it is the cause of the conflict today between Korea and Japan. And uh, next, Korean, Korean national strategy. A North Korean national strategy is to conclude a peace treaty with the United States for ending the condition under the Korean Amistic Agreement uh, which was signed by U.S. as a representative for United Nations Command, North Korea, and uh, Chinese People Volunteer Army in 1953. Uh, th that is the one, the South Korean didn't sign this agreement. That's why North Korea think that South Korea is not counterpart to, co to talk about uh, the uh, how to say, the condition of Korean Peninsula. And even Kim Jong-un is unable to escape from the national strategy. If he tries to escape, he would be killed by a con conservative group. But free respect Kim Il-sung and promise the uh, loyalty to him. And uh, that is not only the conservative group, it's not only the, the uh, of Ch uh, North Korean case, but the, I, I, have, I have been following the North Korea for the last three decades, and also um, I involved quite much of Soviet Union and Russia, and o o also in Russia, a very strong conservative mm -hmm. group. So even today, for instance, uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, of uh, uh, Russia is occupied with conservative group. And then relationships between China and North Korea. The Beijing government concerned very much 
outside of uh, maybe you can see that the outside of Great Wall. Great Wall is around here, just outside of Beijing. And behind the Great, Great Wall, there is uh, there are Inner Mongolia, or three provinces of uh, Northeast China, and that that area is old old Manchuria. And if you go to, I in my experience, uh, I I travel from uh, Rambato of Mongolia to Beijing by train, and I found that. Uh, in uh, in Mongolia, how much Beijing spending money in in the Mongolia for st uh, uh, you know, for stability of their that area, and uh, also uh, another thing is uh, Jil uh, in Jilin province, one of northeast China, Jilin province is just the pink one uh, that. Uh, there is a large, large Korean autonomous uh, pre uh, prefectures, that, that red one over there. The North Korea and uh, those provinces are sort of one of economic zone. They are moving each other and uh, trading each other. So it's the sanction toward North Korea won't work properly. <clears throat> and uh, uh, even Beijing government cannot control those areas. Next. And uh, some change of, uh, some change of North Korea. Um, changing between Kim, Kim, Kim Jong-il era and uh, the father of Kim Jong-un. And today, with uh, uh, Kim Jong uh, Kim Jong uh, Kim Jong uh, time, uh, changing from dark to bright, or gray to colorful, the people face is quite bright today. That is, uh, uh, I I got this, some report from a Russian researcher who constantly visit to there. And uh, they show me uh, many photographs. And uh, so Kim Jong might be, Kim Jong is, uh, uh, he knows quite well outside of country. And uh, his mother was Japanese Korean. She was born in Osaka and moved to, their family moved to North Korea. Uh, so uh, they visited several times, uh, I think, to Japan, quite back close the door, you know. And, uh, so, and also he studied in Switzerland, in Swiss. So he knows quite well outside of the country. And, but, but they, and also Kim Jong might be afraid to be fossilized of, the, of his country. So what we could do on North Korea. Uh, of course, we have to stop their nuclear development, but only pressure on them will not make anything. And uh, uh, most afraid is uh, too strong pressure on them. Uh, the North Korean might to attack to South. So the South Korean will not fight with North, just they will escape from the country. So we have to consider about uh, uh, millions of refugees from South Korea, and most of them want to come to the United States, this country. So if you are ready to receive them or not, that is another question. And uh, uh, also, the six-party talk doesn't mean nothing, actually, no sense, because of the, the six-party talk cannot give North Korean any dream of the future. And uh, there, are, there are, I know, I can understand there are, there are many arguments, but the one of the idea is we should propose or provide Kim Jong-un some idea for modernization of his country. For instance, uh, switch, or, switch to the peaceful use of their missile or rocket technology would be one of them. And of course, 
we can tr trust them fully. So maybe we can pro provide some area in Mongolia that between the, the relationship Mongolia and North Korea is very close, trusted each other. So in, Mon in Mongolia, we can establish sort of international zone for developing, you know, providing to North Korea for uh, developing their uh, missile or rocket for peaceful use. That's, that's kind, such kind of idea we have, we have to consider to give them. And uh, Kim Jong-un Kim Jong surely want to have such a modern country. Then I, I would like to, oh, well, different, opposite way. Uh, U.S.-Japan defense cooperation. Uh, simply, Japan should change their mind. Old, old but new. Uh, the, it's really time to change Japanese mind on U.S.-Japan defense cooperation for strengthen and the increase of Japanese capability. And then such such guy argument has been repeated and repeated for se several decades, but it was old, but it is a new issue which facing a new s stage of threat from China and North Korea. And always in the argument, the other, pe other, uh, other speaker told about Article 9 of J Japanese Constitution, but J Article 9 imposes only physical limit no, is not limiting any thought or uh, behavior of Japanese. So J Jap Japanese has to more you know, think about on, on, on security or what, what Japan can do. And even there is a rule of Article 9, but our defense cooperation need reform for the structure and the way of thinking, especially Japan, exp expand its role in our defense cooperation. And uh, there will be several examples for in increasing our cooperation and increase of Japanese capability that the uh, US-2 uh, will be one of them. And also, for instance, there are uh, retired submarines in Japan. And uh, Japan could cooperate with the U.S. to the uh, renewal of its for strengthen our alliance in the West Pacific region. It means, uh, I, I, I wouldn't try to connect directly, but for instance, Taiwan's submarine is very old but they couldn't get new submarine in Europe. But U.S. has only nuclear power submarines, so U.S. cannot give uh, the nuclear, uh, nuclear submarine to Taiwan. But if Japanese retired submarine can bring to Taiwan, not directly, but through the United States, one, of, one idea. And, uh, but, the, for changing the Japanese mind, it's very hard because of the Minister of Defense and ATRA, and uh, even NSC, METI, Foreign Ministry, they need more study for getting exp get experience and knowledge on defense cooperation, including offset program. Just I expect they would defeat the Japanese fossilized way of thinking and manner, including diplomacy and defense. And the Prime Minister Abe has been also trying to changing the condition of Japan's role. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you for excellent presentations this afternoon. Um, we have time for some questions. 
and again, if you would be so good as to uh, tell us your name and um, the organization you're connected with and the person to whom you are directing the question. And I see a gentleman with his hand raised here in the second row. Uh, Peter Humphrey, I'm an Intel analyst and a former diplomat. Uh, Mr. Giara, isn't a leg of this triumvirate missing? Um, don't we have to sort of clandestinely incorporate Taiwan's capabilities into any large-scale defense pattern? And I mean things down in the nitty-gritty, like communication frequencies, uh, interoperability standards, uh, lots of stuff that when push comes to shove, you'd like it there you know, in five minutes. Um, and would Japan be willing to quietly work with Taiwan to, to better integrate the capabilities of those two nations? Uh, as, as far as I'm concerned, it, with me, you're pushing on an open door, especially in the context of defending Taiwan itself. Of course, we have to have that kind of integration with Taiwan that I've talked about with Japan. Um, but for different reasons, but just as effectively, that integration has been precluded by the presumption uh, that China wouldn't like it. And I, I know. Um, so uh, clandestine agreements only go so far, but I have talked about thinking about these things before you can actually do them. So if that's a, con if that's a, a sort of clandestine planning at least, yes, of course I agree with that. And I, I think Japan is already doing some of those things. Yeah. Okay. My name is Michael Yehuda. I'm attached to George Washington University. And I'd like to ask uh, our two American uh, presenters, uh, who both called for new thinking on the American side. Um, granted that we have a very erratic president right now, but beyond him, have you detected signs of new thinking in the Department of Defense here in Washington? Okay. Signs, uh, apparently, the actual emergence of, of new strategies and, and new approaches, not yet. Um, for example, uh, there, there were un, unsourced reports starting in, in April that uh, the Trump administration was considering the sale of, of the F-35. Uh, there's, you know, we could have a whole panel on the pros and cons of selling the F-35. And, and you know, from the Department of Defense perspective, I imagine uh, that the opinion runs, runs the gamut, but uh, those who favor uh, security of American technology and are less confident in, in Taiwan's ability to secure that technology have a considerable sway. Uh, there are certainly ways to address that, but to date, I, I don't think that uh, there's any sign that the Trump administration is making any positive decision. I mean, in fact, Trump himself, uh, responding to a uh, journalist question at the end of April, uh, uh, implied that uh, he wasn't ready to make such a sale, a sale that uh, for Taiwan could be a bridge from not just into the fifth generation level of air, aerial technologies and capabilities, but also a bridge into the sixth generation. Uh, it's not, it's, I, I would assume that this is understood, but uh, uh, given the slow pace of uh, uh, the leadership turnover, uh, the appointment of, of new people uh, uh, reflective of the new administration, uh, there appears to be too much influence from holdovers who have uh, basically continued 
the previous policies of the previous administration. We have a question I, here in the front I, row. I, may I answer that too? Oh, I'm sorry, Paul. Um, I think that uh, one has to consider presidential power very carefully in these kinds of situations. Um, there is <clears throat> something to be said for presidential support for change, um, but presidents have to very carefully assess uh, their ability to influence and conduct that change. One has to also think about concrete questions together. And people are in the bottom up actions and policies. Uh, that was certainly the case in the 30s with President Roosevelt, for instance, where um, the military was conducting its own planning almost independently of the presidency, but although Roosevelt obviously understood what was going on, but he stepped back from that and let the military do that uh, for political reasons. Um, I think that in the case of President Trump, you'll find that uh, he is going to be disappointed with the change that he has tried to implement, which is to engage the Chinese in problem solving. Um, in the meantime, however, I would not attribute the the stasis of Defense Department, State Department, and intelligence community actions and planning to political holdovers. I believe that that deadlock exists and that change is not forthcoming, but I attribute it to long-serving civil servants, not political appointees, um, that there has not been a case for changing their minds and I'm not sure that they can change their minds. This is one of the reasons why I flagged the, the example of the Navy changing its mind in the interwar period, because it was so unusual, virtually unprecedented, and seldom duplicated. So this is a real problem for introducing the kind of changes which I think are going to be necessary if we're going to, in fact, resist Chinese incursions in every sphere of our lives. A question here in the front row. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, this this has been an excellent uh, panel discussion. Uh, my name is Mitsuo Nakai, uh, Japan native, U.S. citizen, Reagan Foundation. Um, question to you, Paul uh, and Rick. Uh, there is no such a thing as business as usual anymore. It's not effective. It needs to be changed, including national security treaty between U.S. and Japan. Uh, and what I'm talking about is I think Japan should go nuclear, maybe even South Korea. I think they should do everything they can to change the Constitution so they can go for it. There is 70 years of uh, being a pacifist under this treaty is no longer effective. This is not good. And because China is going to whip you, they can. And they may go ahead and do it. They're capable. What happened to Japan? What happened to the Japanese Navy for 70 years? Did nothing. It's time to wake up and, and do it not just a knock-down, drag-out discussion or debate. Knock-down, drag-out action, meaning nuclear. What happened to Japanese spirit? I have no idea. It's gone, disappeared. It's time. It's time for U.S. to start talking about it with Japanese government so that the Japanese citizen can maybe, maybe go for it. So it's going to be easier for a PM Abe to go ahead and do it. That's my question. So what's the possibility, feasibility, in your opinion? Thank you. You want to go first? Let me 
ultimately the choice to go down the road of a nuclear weapons capability is the choice that has to be made by the people of Japan and South Korea. Uh, from where I sit, uh, the appropriate American role would be to reintroduce a capability that our allies accepted up until the early 1990s when it was determined that the threats of the Cold War had receded and uh, we had the luxury of withdrawing our tactical nuclear capabilities. Now, if the Americans do not reintroduce their, this, this, uh, the, a, a tactical nuclear capability, uh, and uh, if such a capability is not made available on a joint base NATO-style situation to our allies, uh, that, to me, would increase the case within South Korea and Japan to make their own decision to develop their own respective capabilities. Uh, from my perspective, speaking for myself, if Japan and South Korea were to make such a decision, I would hope that as an ally, the United States would support that decision and not be afraid of it and understand that it is a stream reaction to a ballooning Chinese threat and a Chinese ballooning Chinese threat via North Korea, via Pakistan, and very soon via Iran. I, I think that it's, it's really important to, um, to separate out these two issues, the issue of Japanese spirit and the issue of nuclear weapons, because I don't think they're the same thing, and I don't necessarily think they're connected. Um, on the, in the first instance, uh, Japan thinking about the situation realistically and objectively and deciding that it has to do something about it, I think that comes under the heading of spirit. Um, and I agree in that sense that Japan has to move forward and do more, both in terms of deciding to do something, but then I get to the second point, which is what to do. Um, nuclear weapons are not some uh, mystical thing. They were, uh, in the Cold War, t the tactical kind of nuclear weapons that we used and deployed, which is what I think Rick and I are talking about, were, were developed and fielded in order to make up for the weaknesses in other ways, in particular because there were, the Red Army in Europe was so big that at, for the first years after World War II, uh, the only way we could compete was with massive firepower, and that's what those tactical nuclear weapons represented. But that came after some analysis and some, uh, some analysis of, of alternatives, and that was the decision that was made. Um, but that kind of thinking, that kind of analysis hasn't been done. It's because the nuclear question is completely off the table in U.S.-Japan discussions. So uh, I, I think it's not, uh, I think it's necessary to think carefully about what you would, what one would use nuclear weapons for. I've, I've thought that through, and I, I think there's a case to be made, but that thinking has not occurred anywhere uh, in, in an organized national way. And um, I, I, I think that thinking about nuclear weapons in this context um, is necessary, uh, but I think it's very, very important not to put the cart before the horse and not to have the nuclear weapons as an end to itself, but rather a means to that end. It, look, we have a lot of questions here, and we don't have much time left, and we've already gone over it. So what I'm going to ask you to do when you ask, when I call on you, is to ask your question in a very short form, and I'm going to ask our answerers up here to answer in a very short form, and then we can try to get as many as possible questions here. Here there's a young lady over here. Thank you. My name is Kate Wright, and my background is communications. Sir, your mm -hmm. reference to the 1910 annexation was marvelous. The humility, yes. 
humility is what sets the stage for my question to Mr. Fisher. Seizing the rhetorical high ground, that seems to me where the political will exists in terms of America and Japan. What are the best ways for us to do that publicly, and in particular as you refer to the North Korean China missiles, just even the simplicity of adding one word, Chinese, to it, how can we further advance that? Because that's how we're going to at least address the political will issue, because it exists in both countries. Yeah, uh, the Japan's annexation of Korea. Uh, Japan's mistake was Japan couldn't manage, same as Toshiba on Westinghouse. That was big, big mistake. That is my answer. Okay. The, the problem goes back to something Paul mentioned earlier of uh, career intelligence and then political uh, appointees in the last administration refusing even to address the issue of Chinese assistance to North Korea's nuclear missiles. Uh, it really, it, it, it can be addressed most directly by members of Congress and senators uh, getting in the habit of uh, adding Chinese to the, to the list. Uh, that would probably be the fastest way to get uh, Mr. President Trump to pay attention and perhaps follow suit. Yes, there's a question right here from the gentleman in the second row. Kevin? Thanks. Russell Shaw with the Global Taiwan Institute, and thank you for an excellent set of presentations. Um, my question is for the two, our two Japanese friends on the, on the, on the stage. And uh, this, this conference is held at a very timely, uh, timely uh, discussion because, uh, as General Dunford said last week, uh, China will be the greatest threat to the U.S. by 2025. And any threat assessment here, though, however, must take into two cons at least two variables, right? Capabilities and intent. And I think we got a lot of the capabilities discussion here today. My, get, my question for uh, the two Japanese uh, experts is, what is your assessment of the PRC's intent in all of this? And do you see it as uh, perhaps what General Fred Dunford said, uh, that, you know, that China will be the greatest threat to Japan uh, by 2025, or perhaps even earlier? Thank you. Uh, the this question is repeated and repeated several decades. And uh, even uh, uh, General Makasa said in 1951, Japanese were 12 years old. And since then, more, nearly, nearly seven decades passed. But uh, Japanese mind, mind of Japanese occupied something uh, they just ex excuse with chapter nine of, uh, you know, but uh, they are very convenient to just following U.S. Th they don't think about on self. They don't uh, take any responsibility on self. Just following, that, that is not only defense, but foreign policy too watching always Washington. So, but I'm frustrating how to change their mind. It's very difficult. And uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe trying also. That is not only uh, foreign policy or uh, defense, but also other you know, policies. And the Japanese government uh, they don't want to change. And also, even, even Japanese companies, they are just, they, they are afraid to change. So it's very difficult to answer exactly what you, uh, you know, to, to you, but the, really we have, uh, we have to consider seriously. That is my, just my, my thought. Uh, 
since this is a very, very uh, sensitive issue, I personally don't want to address uh, deeply, but I'm just a representative for Japanese manufacturer and the production. Uh, now that uh, the tension and the threats are going higher, unusual situation, I feel, I personally have to do something between the two countries, a kind of asset or some, uh, some of the cooperation is never work, but some of the kind of asset is a very good uh, solution. So that's all for now. Thank you. Thank you for your coming. All right, we have time for one more question right here. Um, my name is Joel Coulter. Thank you again for best defense cooperation presentation. I represent Honeycomb Networks, but I advise DOD on ship to shore expeditionary. Two, you made two points, Paul and Rick. Rick said that there needs to be some kind of information sharing, surveillance, cooperation, and then Paul said something about the key for interoperability. Whatever we do in the peak, could you kind of go further on that? What you mean by? involving India and sharing and then also interoperability that you talked about, Paul? India first. Okay. Um, yes, I, I, I've been developing a uh, sort of a policy point for, for several years uh, along those lines and uh, my, my suggestion uh, made in multiple capitals has, has been to begin uh, through uh, even something as simple as a very secure common server put in an undisclosed location that uh, all manner of agreed upon surveillance data be pooled and given and, and joint access be made uh, either to the degree that information is offered or at, at, at to whatever degree uh, all of the parties uh, seek but the idea here is to counter the growing Chinese ability to uh, deploy very rapidly across their landmass and to begin military preparations on one side of their country that they would then initiate on the other side of their country, such as either against India. Operations could, could originate in, in the Eastern theater or ver vice versa against Taiwan and Japan. And so there is really a, a need for a multilateral uh, uh, level of cooperation amongst the democracies to uh, increase our level of awareness of what the Chinese are about to do. Um, thanks for the question. Um, I, I would suggest that the whole idea of linear operations and combat and warfare is completely gone. Um, and that even under those circumstances, unity of command is sort of the primary principle of success on the battlefield. That's why, that's what uh, uh, Napoleon recognized. He would always rather fight uh, against two good generals rather than one bad one, because he knew he could split the two ge good generals no matter how good they were, or at least try. And it, as I said, he only failed at, at the Waterloo battlefield. Um, but with the demise of linear warfare and the whole idea of, of webs rather than chains, um, this notion of, of a common picture and unity of command is going to be really, really important. Um, now, I don't believe, first, I'm not talking about the subordination of, of one nation to the other. That's not what I'm getting at. Uh, I, I, it is a first principle, although I think on the battlefield, something like that's going to have to happen. Somebody's going to have to be in charge. Um, but right now, um, what we see is, is virtually ancient and certainly archaic exchange of information, military technical information at the operational level. Archaic uh, in the face of 21st century plus um, realities of new systems for command and control coming online. This is a tremendous, divisive, destructive, and self-defeating reality that has to be uh, redressed. Otherwise, we're just going to be literally eaten alive 
on the battlefield by an opponent that understands this quite well and is perfectly willing to take advantage of it. Uh, I'd like to thank all our panelists uh, this morning, this afternoon, for excellent presentations. Um, please stay tuned. We will have more conferences on this subject. I'd like to thank you, our audience, for uh, joining us this afternoon for your um, excellent listening and fine questions, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. <clears throat>